Hi, this is Jason Bobar. I'm Principal Engineer at LA Networks for our Los Angeles-based Cisco VAR. And today we're going to be covering a rather high-level, broad topic. It's the uh, ACI tenant model. And uh, we'll talk about the, the tenant model, what the different objects are, and how they interrelate to one another. And that's rather important. This is kind of the crux of ACI in a lot of ways. And um, it's one of those items that you're going to spend, as I mentioned on the, the menu system video, you're going to spend a lot of time in the tenant menu. So it's important for you to understand the difference between the networking components in the tenant and the application components in the tenant. Uh, even if you're going to go into network-centric mode, um, it's still very important to understand these constructs because there's so much in ACI built around it. That being said, let's go ahead and take a look at the tenant model. Okay, so let's get started. Here we are looking at a drawing for the tenant model within um, Cisco ACI. This isn't anything Cisco generated. I generated this, so it may not be the best, but to me, uh, it seemed to make some sense, and I'll kind of talk through this, and then we'll take a look at the APIC. The tenant is a top-level object within ACI, and within the tenant, I have sub objects and uh, two of the most important ones are the VRF also sometimes called the context I just think of it as a VRF that's how it instantiates and the other one is the application profile also sometimes called application network profile again I just think of it as an AP or an application profile that can be confusing to some people they like ANP because AP they think of uh, access point Within the VRF, we have an object called the bridge domain. The bridge domain actually holds a subnet. So, you know, the bridge domain here might be 10.1.1.0 slash 24 and 10.1.2.0 24, etc. The endpoint group is a very critical object. It's actually under the application profile, but it associates the application profile with the bridge domain. So, the endpoint group is a very important object because it's an associating object within for, for different objects. And so I get to call in these other, I, I get to link the VRF with the application profile and define how an application is going to work. Under the endpoint group, there's a lot of things I might configure. Domain, meaning virtual or physical, what ports go into that endpoint group, contracts, etc. In ACI, there's really two deployment methods, application-centric, which is the default, which probably isn't too surprising given the name, or network-centric. What's interesting is virtually all of the training focuses on application-centric, but in my experience, most people deploy, even proof-of-concept deploy, in network-centric. And that's because you're usually asking your network team to help with the deployment and they come from a more network-centric approach. So the big difference is that in network-centric, a traditional VLAN equals an ACI bridge domain, which equals an ACI EPG. It's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one relationship. And uh, as you can tell, a VRF can have multiple bridge domains. That's not too surprising. The bridge domain is defining basically where my flooding behavior occurs within. The endpoint group, basically says what physical ports for this application profile go into each of these bridge domains and get associated with this flooding behavior. Also, unless you're doing uh, something special, any ports that are in the same EPG or endpoint group can freely communicate with one another. There is no restriction. However, to go from one endpoint group to another, if I have endpoint group A, over here in B and C and D, then you would find that A to B, B to C, and so forth require something called a contract to allow that communication. We might get into contracts in its own video, but I just want you to be aware of that. Uh, a lot of times in network-centric mode, people get rid of that whitelisting behavior. There is a, a default contract called the common contract which is effectively a permit all. And you can put that in place on these. And then your endpoint groups are not restricted from talking to one another. 
And you might think that that ruins a lot of the pristine capabilities of ACI. And I understand that argument, but keep in mind a couple of things. Number one is the current data center is not based off of a whitelist model. I can't just enforce a whitelist model onto each tenant and expect that data center to operationalize very well. And two, there's actually no limit between cohabitating with network centric and application centric. You could deploy day one in network centric. And once you get used to ACI and how it works, you could then say, okay, from now on, any new application profiles I build are going to be application centric. And the two can coexist just fine. Or you could take one that had been network centric and convert it to application centric. So they're not mutually exclusive of one another. So just keep that in mind. But if you're new to this and you're a network engineer, which is what I'm building these videos for, you really want to look at the network centric mode, I think. Um, I think that's a better model for most you know, NXOS style engineers. Uh, where I can just say, okay, what's a bridge domain? It's the same as a VLAN, and it's uh, also the same as an EPG. It's a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one relationship, and that simplifies a lot for us. In application-centric mode, I don't have to do that. Each bridge domain could have multiple endpoint groups, right? And uh, that gets a little mind-bending to the normal network engineer because if they're all in the same flood domain, I would think that they can all talk, except they're in different EPGs, so without a contract, they can't talk. They could share uh, subnets or not. Um, you could have two items in the same subnet that cannot communicate because there's no contract between them and they're in different endpoint groups, which is just a bizarre construct initially to the, the traditional network engineer, myself included. From a configuration standpoint, we're in our APIC here. We would just come into tenants. I'm in a slightly different system today. This is a shared lab environment. There's I, I didn't name this this tenant name, Jason Bomar 1194. It was created for me through a script. So normally when you create a tenant, you create it under your own uh, naming convention. And we've already talked about Naming conventions. You can see under the tenant, here's where I've got my application profiles. Here's where I have my networking. Uh, items we're not going we're not going to cover L4 to 7 right now, or some of these security uh, troubleshooting and monitoring. Security is very important. This is where I set up those contracts, and I may do a whole video just on contracts. But today, for right now, we're just going to look at these two. Uh, top level items, the application profile and the networking. The networking is where I create my VRFs. And you can see I have one VRF in here right now called context underscore one. This is all created through a, an automated script, actually. But if I wanted to create a new VRF, I could just right click here and I could go to create VRF. Likewise, I could click on the networking folder up here and I have a drag and drop. I could just grab the VRF object and all this is happening. Keep in mind, all this is happening within my tenant and my tenant only. So when I, if I drag and drop a VRF down here, it actually just takes me through the exact same dialogue as if I had right clicked and gone to create VRF. Okay. It's functionally and operationally no different. It's just a matter of preference. Do you prefer the drag and drop visual? method or do you prefer to use uh, the menus and either right clicking or going up to actions i tend not to do the drag and drop i tend to do uh, going through the menu systems and when you're first starting out i tend to recommend that so that you're used to what is under each of these menu systems i should point out that in this is version 1.2 and we're currently on 2.1 of aci in the newer versions of aci uh, these drag and drop mechanisms have gotten much nicer. And when I create these, whether I create them over on the menu system or dragging and dropping, if I come back here, I get a logical graphical representation of each of my applications and each of my networks within a tenant. And it's actually quite nice. And you can move the items around, unlike on the inventory fabric discovery that we looked at earlier. Um, I can move these items around so that I can picture them the way I want. And then I can take a look at them and 
you know, do a screen capture or something for my documentation purposes. It's actually quite nice. I will, I will say in the newer versions. Uh, also under networking, we have our bridge domains, as I mentioned before. Uh, again, there's a bridge domain here that's already created. And if I click on here, you'll see, uh, again, this was just created through a, a script, but you can see that the bridge domain cannot exist without being linked to a VRF. And if I right clicked and created a new bridge domain, one of the mandatory fields is what VRF is this associated with? It's already in the tenant. So it's you need to always keep in mind that that top level object is the tenant. You're always within a tenant. Now the tenant could be common, which means that everyone has access to it, or it could be a specific tenant. Here they're named after different lab exercises. Within an enterprise, they might be named, you know, dev, test, and prod, for example, right? But when I create a, a bridge domain object, it has to be associated with a, a VRF. Uh, you have to determine uh, what your uh, be, uh, flooding behavior is going to be like and whether it's going to be a flood or an optimized hardware proxy. A lot of times they're proxies and optimized. If it's internal to the fabric, it will be a flood if it uh, has external connectivity to another fabric. And if you want to see what subnets are in that bridge domain, you just click on the L3 configurations and it lets you know. The gateway address is the address that will be instantiated on any leaf that that bridge domain is configured for, meaning that there's an endpoint group on that leaf. Remember that the endpoint group is linking the application profile onto the bridge domain. So if that particular EPG is present on say six different leaves, then all six of those are going to have the virtual gateway address of, in this case, 198.18.1.1, okay? So it's using an Anycast HSRP-like behavior to make that all work so that every host, his gateway is local to the leaf that, that he is on. If I come up under application profiles, in this older version, I don't have a very good drag and drop methodology, but normally I do. Uh, and I can drag down my EPGs and so forth. Oh, actually, it's down here under the actual applications. Here I can drag down and create EPGs. I can create contracts. This VZ any means basically the, the common contract, meaning that it can talk to any endpoint group. Okay. And if I ex expand these applications that have been created, app application profiles have been created, You'll see one of the first ones that we have is application EPGs. And if I take a look at the application EPGs, this is where you see what kind of domain is it? Is it a VM domain? Is it a bare metal domain? Uh, static bindings, meaning what ports are actually bound to this EPG. So again, an EPG might have many ports. It might have hundreds of ports in your data center if, if I have hundreds of hosts that need to connect into it, for example, right? Or it might be a very small number of ports that are in that particular EPG. A lot of times when we're doing labs or POCs, it's a small number. I can set up my contracts here. Again, that's a little bit out of scope right now. We might do a whole video just on contracts. Um, and uh, L4 to L7 services, I haven't decided yet whether or not we're going to do any L4 to L7 uh, service insertion labs uh, or videos. But all the specific configuration for that endpoint group is going to be done under that endpoint group. And that endpoint group is what ties it to the bridge domain. So don't forget that endpoint group is that critical object that's affiliating, you know, the bridge domain, which is within the VRF to this application profile, right? Anyway, that's everything. Uh, I hope you found this helpful. As always, uh, I'd love to hear your comments or suggestions or questions. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank you.